You're listening to the Eldest Jiry Channel. <laughs> Chapter 9 The Bone Chamber Brother Dawson waited until mid-morning before returning to the attic room to find the professor asleep, but decided to awaken him with a gentle tug on the shoulder. Oh, my goodness, the professor exclaimed. What a terrible bad dream I've just had. I dreamt I was still in that bloody stone room. I need to tell you what I discovered yesterday in the witch's cave on my way to get you. Not a witch, I hope. Bones. What type of bones, brother? Human bones. Children's bones. How did you find them? I thought that cave had been searched long ago. It was several times, but not where I went. I was going down from the main cave to the river through the tunnels, when I found myself in a smaller cave, not the river as I'd expected. Although quite a bit smaller, it was still a good-sized cave, and as I shone my torch around the floor, I saw the bones, except I thought they were rocks at first. An awful discovery, but at least you know some of the children's remains exist and weren't swept out to sea and lost. Were there any adult bones? None, replied the brother. But the children's bones weren't in a pile or scattered about. They were arranged in patterns, pentagrams. Those evil hags had laid out the femurs as pentagrams, and five skulls were put between their points. That's grotesque. Have you told anyone else? No, I wanted your opinion as to what we should do next. Well, I would like to see them for myself. Would you take me there? I will, but it's a grim sight I really don't want to lay eyes on again. I, I do understand, but I, I want to take photographs of them. Are you recovered enough from your ordeal for us to go there this afternoon? I think so. I'm keen to keep up on the momentum and get this thing properly investigated. If I ever get away from this place, I will write it all up as a paper or even a book. But none, no one, will ever believe it. After lunch, Brother Dawson sneaked some food back to the professor, and they went down to his room to collect his camera, then out through a side door, unnoticed, down to the sea cliffs below. Watch your step when we get to the rocks, warned the brother. I turned over my ankle yesterday, but luckily I didn't strain anything. Otherwise, you may still be in that godless chamber. <laughs> Perish the thought, shuddered the professor. It was yet another dull gray windy day as they headed for Lover's Crag, where the witch's cave lay beneath. The cave entrance was well hidden, only visible once inside a deep fissure on the cliff face, perilously close to a near vertical drop to the rocks below. Lovers throughout history met on the large ledge twenty feet or so above, unaware they were within the power of the witches who craved the power of the young girl's lustful passion to insidiously sap from them to turn them into crones and witches to make up their numbers. Brother Dawson led the way. That's some drop to the sea, brother. How did you manage to get here in the dark just by torchlight? He must nidus go the julis deris. What was that? Needs? Must when the devil drives. I had no choice. I had to save you. And I am very grateful you did, too, Brother Dawson. If we get through here, it opens out inside, he instructed the professor. It then gets easier for a while. Sure enough, the witch's cave revealed itself in the same manner as Duncan's cave. A vast limestone cave filled with artifacts from long ago, old chairs and rough beds, dilapidated cupboards and piles of battered pots and pans, beside a long, redundant, blackened hearth hewn into the rock floor and wall. Do you know how long a coven existed here? For well over a thousand years, they reckon. Alice Bennett was just one in a long line of crones who took to the dark side in response to persecution, just because they were clever at cures and so-called spells. 
They were considered in league with the devil because of their apparent supernatural powers, but they were just intelligent women who didn't wish to mix with ordinary folk and lived their lives in a group of like-minded women. Persecution creates revenge, so they took to using their powers to lure young girls into their coven and to kidnapping the children of those families who had sought to decimate them. How did you learn all these things? From the Grimsfell elders, who passed on their stories over the centuries, George Morgan at the pub has collected the stories, but who knows if they're true or not. Stories can become changed completely after many tellings, with false embellishments added along the way. Now, that was also my thinking. Otherwise, it all seems too fantastic to be true. But he found old papers buried in the wall which supports the stories. Your discovery of the pentagram bones are surely highly significant, then. Unless someone is raiding old graves to perpetrate a hoax. Where are the bones, then? On the way down to the river. I'll show you when I catch my breath. At the far end of the witch's cave, a narrow, low tunnel continued for many yards until it sloped steeply downwards. Brother Dawson shone his light down whilst the professor used his to look back at where they had come, to reassure himself that they could get back, if anything untoward happened. They became aware of a cold draft and a distant roaring the further they descended, a sure sign the river was near. Somewhere near the bottom of this shaft, I, I took a turning away from the river tunnel without realizing it. That's when I discovered the bone chamber, as I call it, explained the brother with a tone of anticipation coloring his voice. Have you got your film wound on and your flashbulbs ready? Yes, all set and ready to capture this vital piece of evidence, said the eager professor fiddling with his flash gun. I'm sure it's somewhere near here. Ah, aha! Following the brother through yet another tight gap, the torchlight lit up the scene. Laid out before them, in the center of the cave were the pentagrams, exactly as he had described them. Each arrangement had five skulls neatly placed between the vertices, formed by the fifteen femurs with a central pentagram, making up the inverted pentagrams. The professor took out his camera and screwed in the first flash bulb, then adjusted the focus and exposure settings on the lens turret, according to his light meter, using the limited light from both their steadied torches. I hope the flash works. It should, with the new Everettis fitted. With bated breath, he pressed down the shutter lever, which resulted in a blinding but satisfying flash, much to their relief. The completed twelve exposures committed the many bone pentagrams to film and were then safely wound on to the uptake spool. We're not going back to the abbey along the river, said the professor. He meant it as a statement rather than a question. No, I don't fancy repeating that just now either. It took a good hour to exhaustively climb back up the way they had come and on out of the witch's cave back onto the cliff face path to the top. They walked a little further along the cliff to the little path which ran down to Lover's Crag and sat down for a well-earned rest before attempting the rising landscape up to the abbey when a shot rang out, echoing around the crags. I'm hit! gasped the professor, grasping the brothers' arms. Let's get out of here. They were on their feet in seconds as two more shots were fired. With quick-thinking reactions, the professor held up his camera to face the gunman, who ran off, fearing his picture would incriminate him. That was a good idea, said the relieved brother. It was, wasn't it? agreed the professor. Did you see who it was? Put it like this. Brother Thomas is no longer a missing person. I thought that bugger would have another go at me.